uh, John chapter 1. We're going to look at a few verses together and then do a quick study tonight on these verses. The Gospel of John chapter 1, and uh, we're going to begin reading in verse number 1, read down through verse number 5. Once you found it, please stand with me, if you would, out of respect for the reading of God's Word. John chapter 1, beginning in verse number 1. We will read these five verses in unison together. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Father, we love you. And Lord, I ask that in these next few moments you would open our hearts, uh, Father, to that which you would have for us. Father, that you would help us to be sensitive to the moving of your Holy Spirit who desires to conform us to the image of your Son. Lord, I pray that you would give us a good attention tonight, even on this Wednesday night in the middle of a busy week, uh, after a very long week. Father, give us a good attention to your word and that which you desire to do in these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So I'm going to start Wednesday night with a quiz. The quiz is simply this. Uh, What is our theme for the year, church? Our theme is what? He must increase. And that's really good because we don't even have the answers up there for you anymore. And so some of you spot on. You know where we're going. So church, our theme for the year is what it is. He must increase. increase. You know, why do we have a missions conference and a missions program? Because he must increase. He must increase in all the world. He must increase among all people. Do you know why we have an Awana program? Because he must increase, and he must increase in the heart and in the mind of our youth. Do you know the reason that we're in church tonight? Because he must increase, the increase of the edifying of his body in love. He must increase. One of the ways that he can increase in our lives is when you and I increase our understanding of who he is. In church, I find it very interesting that throughout the Bible, the Lord Jesus is referred to by a number of different titles and a number of different names. As you read throughout the scriptures, it's estimated that there are around 200 different titles and names that refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now church, true or false, Jesus is the answer. You know it's true in Sunday school, Jesus is the answer, right, Brother John? Probably just about every question. I mean, Jesus is the answer. But the reality is, in life, isn't Jesus the answer? You know what? When you look at the mess in in Congress today, guess what? Jesus, not the next election, is the answer. And when you look at the strife and the chaos on our streets, you know what the answer is? It's Jesus Christ. And the hopelessness that's in the hearts of men. Do you know what's the answer, church? The answer is... Jesus. The answer for the broken heart is, the answer for the broken family is, the answer is Jesus and Jesus Christ. And so if Jesus truly is the answer, then the key to our understanding and our successful Christian living is to understand Jesus. Now you and I, like the Apostle Paul, must, must give ourselves that we might know him. And so I'd like to look, if we could, at some of these names, some of these titles that are used to refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hopefully diving in, developing a deeper understanding of who He is. And so tonight I want to simply look at Jesus, the Word. Here in Gospel of John chapter 1, Jesus is referred to as the Word. Now, I want you to understand what this means. The the Word here, the Greek word behind Word, is the Greek word logos. And and it is a loaded word, uh, to say the least. Uh, But I'll summarize it this way. Uh, The word Word, in our setting tonight, it, it means the embodying of a concept or idea. It is both the reason and the reality of the thing being considered. So let me give you an example. So you're watching a program on television. Perhaps it's your favorite game show. Perhaps it's your favorite sporting event. And they come to a break and they say, Now a word from our sponsor. What happens next? Do you see toothpaste? Is that what happens? Now a word from our sponsor. Deodorant. Now a word from our sponsor. 
Pepsi. Is that what we get? No, when we hear the phrase, now a word from our sponsor, we expect that we are about to receive uh, a a message, uh, the, the concept, the idea fleshed out before us. We are going to understand the reason and the reality of what they're trying to sell us. Amen. They don't just say deodorant. No, Old Spice puts on a show. They don't just say Pepsi. Boy, they show you those bubbles in glistening detail. And so when the Bible calls Jesus the Word, it means that Jesus here is going to reveal to us several things about His person. I want you to look with me in verses 1 and 2. The Bible says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. We understand that Jesus is the Word. I want us to see first that this reveals His divine person. This reveals his divine person. You know, the Bible is very clear that Jesus Christ is eternal God. Jesus Christ is eternal God. You know, John 1.1 is very purposefully uh, in parallel with Genesis 1.1. You know Genesis 1.1, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's say it again. Ready? Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so we see here a very direct parallel in John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In other words, from the outset, John wants us to know that in the beginning, the Word was Now, this doesn't refer to the start of the word, but this is simply a state of being. That that when God decided that the beginning of time should take place, that the word already was. Jesus Christ is eternal God. You see, in the Gospels, Jesus became flesh. But he was, is, and always will be God. Jesus Christ is absolute and supra-temporal. That's a wonderful word, meaning he is above and beyond time. In fact, when Jesus was in one of those wonderful discussions with the scribes and Pharisees, and they were questioning him about things, you remember what he said in John chapter 8 and verse number 58? He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. I am. Jesus Christ declared, and here in John 1, 1, it is taught that Jesus Christ is eternal God. And the word here has no beginning. And the word here never will have an ending. And the word belongs to eternity because Jesus Christ, the word, is God. And So what does it say when he is the word? He is revealing something to us. He is revealing his divine person that he is eternal God and he is equally God. And so, of course, think with me. The word has the idea. It is the embodying of a concept or idea. And so we see in the Bible, the scriptures tell us that Jesus became flesh. And when Jesus became flesh, he revealed God to us. John chapter 1 in verse number 14 puts it this way. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. And so Jesus the word became flesh and revealed God to us. Now let me point out here. We don't serve multiple gods. We serve the one true God. The one true God triune God, three in one, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Some of you think that doesn't make sense. Well, to our human minds, we really can't fully wrap our heads around it, can we? But let me give you a couple of things that will help you. Number one, let me, let me suggest you're thinking the wrong math problem. It's not one plus one plus one. Think of it as one times one times one. We have the three, but in, when it's all said and done, it comes together to equal one. You think about it this way, the triunity of our universe. We have space, time, and matter, and yet it makes up our universe. Think about the triunity of our person, body, soul, and spirit. And so we serve one, the one true God. Triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Some people get tripped up, though, because because we think the Son of God, and we think, well, doesn't that refer to an origin? Because when I talk about my Son in the flesh, my Son, when I began to call Him my Son, it's because He began. But that is not the case when it comes to the Son of God. 
It, it speaks not of his origin, but of his order to the class in which he belongs. Let me give you a couple of verses here. John 1 and verse number 18, just a little farther down this chapter. The Bible says, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Here, referring to Jesus, the Word is the Son of God, being the one who has declared the Father unto us. You go to John 10, in verse number 30, Jesus says this, he says, I and my Father are one. Here's what you have to understand about the biblical verbiage that is used. When it says sons of God, it is not referring uh, to lineage, but to the order to which they belong. Let me give you an Old Testament example. You remember in the Old Testament when it refers to the sons of the prophets. Uh, the, the group that would follow Elijah and Elisha around the sons of the prophets. We see them even come up some in the kings and other places. And so these sons of the prophets were these a bunch of men who had been born of prophets. No, this wasn't saying that these men had daddies or granddaddies who were prophets. No, th this was saying that, that these men belonged to the order of the prophets. And so when Jesus Christ, the Word, is called the Son of God, it means that Jesus belongs, is of the order of God. He is divinity. It is a full claim to full deity that in identity Jesus is God. Colossians 2 and verse number 9 simply puts it this way. For in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In nature, Jesus is God. In identity, Jesus is God. That Jesus, the Word, is the God of the universe. And church, hear me. We will never go forward until we get grounded here. That when it comes to Jesus, the Word, that, that He who has declared the Father to us, He is God. And there is none higher. You know, we're coming up on Christmas season. And I spent a lot of time thinking about that baby in a manger. But Jesus is so much more than a baby in a manger. Jesus, the Word, is God. Jesus, the Word, is the eternal King of all. And so when it refers to us that in the beginning was the Word, what is this that, that Jesus is revealing? He is revealing His divine person, that He is eternally God, that He is equally God. He is God. The Word was made flesh. But let's continue on. Look at verse number 3. What else does this, this truth that He is the Word, the, the, the embodiment of, of the reason and the reality of God, what else does it declare to us? Verse number 3 says, All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Not only does it reveal His divine person, but Jesus, the Word, reveals His divine power. Reveals His divine power. You know that verse right there says, all things. Greek word, panta, pan panta, meaning all things individually, all things separately. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In, in essence, this is a reference to the infinite detail in creation. Do you know creation is infinitely bigger than you and I can imagine? You know, some of us sometimes think Clyde is pretty big. Until we visit New York, or Chicago, or Fremont. Or Fremont. <laughs> and then we're put in perspective. Some of us still think the world revolves around us, but it does not. You know, creation itself is infinitely larger than we can imagine. You think about the earth, for instance. You stop and think about how big this earth is. Until you recognize it's really not that big because it would take 1.3 million earths to fill up the sun. So basically, if every penny that the boys and girls brought in times 10 were the size of earth, we could fill up the sun. 1.3 million earths to fill up the sun. The sun is huge, except it's not. In comparison to other stars, like the star Antares, which could hold 64 million of our suns. 
I can't wrap my head around that. 64 million of our sons, that would be 64 million times 1.3 million for how many Earths it would take. Boy, that star Antares is ginormous, except there's a star in the constellation Hercules that could hold 100 million Antares. Does your head hurt yet thinking about it? The Milky Way galaxy alone is estimated to have 200 billion stars. The Milky Way galaxy alone. And there are billions and trillions of known galaxies. And yet the Bible says he calls the stars by name. You know, creation is infinitely bigger than you and I can imagine. But I could, we could go the other way too. Creation is infinitely smaller than you and I can imagine. You know, the atom is considered the building block of matter. If we took one drop of water and we converted the atoms of one drop of water into grains of sand, there would be enough sand, there would be enough atoms in one drop of water to build a half mile wide, one foot thick road running all the way from New York to San Francisco. In one drop of water. Yet Jesus, the Word... Spoke it all into existence out of nothing, I add. And measures it as it were with just the palm of his hand. Not anything was made. Not anything exists. Not in the past, not presently. Nor will one thing persist but for him and by him. Colossians puts it this way in Colossians 1 in verse number 16. For all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth. That are the earth visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And, and by him all things consist. That means that the breath you just took was by him. And the breath you're about to take will only be by him as well. Oh, you think about creation and how the heavens declare the glory of God. Jesus Christ, the Word, is the center of all things. He is the creator of and the reason for every breath you take. Reveals His divine power. And the enormity beyond our comprehension and the infinitesimal beyond our comprehension. It is all created and held together by God. The word revealing his divine power. Now what you think of this. Jesus, the word who made all things. Remember, made all things. And without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus, the word who made all things, needs no thing. I need a lot of things. I need my wife. I need my wife. I'd be a mess if it weren't for my wife. I need my kids. You know, I give them a hard time sometimes. I really do. But I need my kids. I don't know what in the world I would do if it weren't for my kids. You know what? I, I, need, I need a place to live. I need a place to live. You know, I, I, need, I need a job. I need a purpose. I need something to do. Like, I, I'm so grateful that the Lord allows me to minister here. Because to, to think about life with no purpose, what would life even be about? I need a lot of things. But Jesus, the word who made all things, is in need of no thing. He chooses to create us. He chooses to love us, to use us, to associate with us. And I don't mean to hurt your feelings tonight, but you need to understand, he doesn't need us. We need him. You know, there's this idea out there in a lot of, a lot of Christianity that, that, boy, God was lonely or God didn't think it would be heaven without us. And so he needed us. God doesn't need us. It was heaven when, when, it, when it was just God. And it would still be heaven with just God because that is the essence of heaven is the presence of God. You and I can add nothing to him. He adds everything to us. He is marvelous. He is magnificent. He is self-existent. He is self-evident. He is eternally sovereign. And Jesus, the Word, reveals His divine power beyond that which you and I can comprehend. 
Jesus the Word, it reveals His divine person. Jesus the Word, it reveals His divine power. I want to leave you with this thought tonight. Look with me at verses 4 and 5. The Bible says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Jesus, the Word, He reveals some things, reason and reality. As, as He reveals God, the, the, the glory of the Father to us, as He reveals the Godhead to us, he, He's revealing the divine person. He's revealing the divine power. But that being revealed, it reveals our deficient praise. It reveals our deficient praise. Have you ever stopped to think about just how incomprehensible God is? You know, I think sometimes we feel like if we've been to a couple weeks of Sunday school, we got it all figured out. I grew up in a Christian home. I know who God is. I went to a Christian school. I know God. I've been to church X number of years. I know God. Hey, newsflash. Our God is incomprehensible. You and I can't even begin to scratch the surface of who our God is. Let me put it into perspective. Some of you have been married decades and you still haven't figured out your wife. What makes you think you figured out God? He is incomprehensible. His ways and thoughts are high, high above us as the heavens are high above the earth. His his ways are unimaginable. His power is indescribable. His glory is unbeholdable. You and I could never begin to even scratch the surface of his person, much less fully grasp him. Grasp him who, who dwells outside of time, space, and matter. And yet Jesus, in Jesus, God is revealed to us. In Jesus, God is revealed to us. The incomprehensible is made known. He who is light entered our darkness. And why God has chosen to love us, to reveal himself to us, to make himself available to us, I will never understand. Especially considering our track record. You ever think about our track record? Let's go back to the Garden of Eden and consider the track record of man. God who created paradise. God who planted man and woman in a garden paradise. God who offered full and open fellowship with man in that garden paradise. How did man respond? How did man repay the paradise that God had granted? How did we respond? We did what? We we rebelled. We rebelled against God. Cosmic treason, if you will. Against the king of kings. And yet God in his mercy. God in his mercy made a promise there to Adam and Eve, our first parents. That that, that the Lord would send one who would crush the head of the serpent. And so God input hope into the life of humanity. And God allowed humanity to continue to live and to continue to know him, albeit in a different way. And how did humanity respond to God's grace? You know, if I were God, I'd have wiped him off the face of the earth and started all over. But how did humanity respond to God's grace? Not six chapters in, in the days of Noah, what do we find? That in response to God's grace, the thoughts and intents of the heart of man was only what? It's only wicked in the sight of God. And so in... Response to God's grace, how did man respond? We rebelled. We rebelled against God. And so God sent a flood. You go several chapters further in the book of Genesis and you find that God calls out Abram. And that God begins through Abram to call himself out of people. And God has chosen a people, the people of Israel. And God is going to use and bless this people. And he's given them the Abrahamic covenant that God would bless them, that bless them, and curse them, that curse them. And multiply their descendants as the star of the sky. And, and give them land and, and all sorts of blessing. And God blesses this people and they multiply multiply and become great in the earth and and, and God begins to and hmm. what was Israel's response to God over and over and over again how did Israel respond to God's grace and blessing upon them 
They rebelled. They rebelled. Over and over and over again. You know, we'll go past the Old Testament at this point, come to the New Testament. When God sent Emmanuel, He sent His Son. He sent his son, Emmanuel, God with us. The Messiah has come, the one who the prophets have foretold for hundreds of years. The hope of Israel, the Prince of Peace. He's come, the Lamb of God, as John said, that would take away the sins of the world. He's come, he's come, he's come. And how did humanity respond? They did what, church? They they rebelled. And yet even in that rebellion, God poured out His grace. God used the greatest rebellion of man to produce His great plan of redemption for you and I. And in that shed blood of Jesus Christ, He provided forgiveness, remission of sins. And in that empty tomb, that resurrection morn, He provided victory over death, hell, and the grave. He provided life eternal and God's provision. And God has made this salvation. He has made this salvation available and free that that whosoever will may come. And yet mankind, in spite of God's gift and God's grace, mankind continues to rebel. rebel. And church, when I consider who He is, His divine person, the eternal, the sovereign, the holy, the righteous, the magnificent, the marvelous, the one whom not even the angels look upon as they fly around crying, holy, holy, holy. Creator God made flesh when I consider who He is and I consider who I am. You know what? I'm reminded of how little I recognize, how little I appreciate the unspeakable gift that we have been given. You know, God did not have to be made flesh. God did not have to reveal himself to us in this way. God could have left us to rot in our rebellion, and yet he didn't. The Bible says that the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And We think how awful, how awful, how awful that this world doesn't recognize the light of Christ. But let me ask us tonight. How long has it been since you and I have been moved by the light that Jesus is? How long has it been since something has stirred in our hearts, since we have been moved by the reality that Jesus Christ, the Word, is eternal God? How long has it been since we have been moved by Jesus? You know, light changes things, doesn't it? Light It reveals reality. Light, it reveals danger. Light, it grabs your attention. Light, it discomforts those in darkness. I'm going to tell you, when the light turns on and you're in the darkness, it's not a comfortable thing. Your eyes take a little while to get adjusted. And if it's in the morning time and the alarm clock's gone off, or kids come in and turn the light on, you put a pillow over your face. Because the light is a great discomfort to those who are used to darkness. And church, I think sometimes we tell us, well, maybe we've just gotten used to the light. I want to tell you that you and I will never, will never, will never, will never get used to the light that He is. We may get used to the light in this room. We may get used to the light on a sunny day. But you and I will never get used to the light that He is. And the reality is when we cease to be moved by the light. When we cease to have our attention grabbed by the light. When we cease to see our reality and the danger around us. When we cease to be discomforted by the light. It's because that we have stopped appreciating the light like we should. To see Jesus even in his earthly form and his transfiguration, the Bible describes in Matthew 17 and verse number 2, it describes Jesus in his transfigured form as one whose face, his raiment was white as light. His face did shine as the sun. 
First Timothy chapter 6, it describes Jesus this way, beginning in verse number 14. That they'll keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which in his time shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Look at what it says. Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be ever honor and power everlasting. Amen. I tell you, that paints a picture of a light. It paints a picture of a light that puts me in my place, that brings me to my knees. You look at the glorified Lord in, the Revel- in, in, in John's revelation, as we see Revelation 1, beginning in verse number 16. It says, in his right hand he had seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And what was John's reaction to this? When, when, when his countenance shone as the sun in its strength, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. You see, when you and I allow ourselves to appreciate the Lord Jesus for who He is, for what He reveals, the glory of the Father, light changes things. And I worry because so often we can sing of Him and be unmoved. We can pray to Him. And be unmoved. That we can read of him. And we can meditate on him. And be unmoved. Church, he is the word. He is Emmanuel. God with us. And if we have gotten over that. If we have gotten to the place where we are no longer moved by that. How in the world could we expect the world to be drawn to him? If you and I aren't moved anymore, why in the world would they be moved? You see, modern Christianity has twisted their theology. And they've got a mangled mess on their hands. You see, modern Christianity makes their theology all about you. Very often you can boil down messages in modern Christianity to, 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 to go something along these, these lines. You have a wonderful life and you're doing the best you can. And the best you can is wonderful. Keep doing the best you can. And I'm going to tell you, you have it all except for one little thing. And that one little thing that, that you need to add to be able to have your best life now, that one little thing you need to add is Jesus. You see, modern Christianity gives the idea that you have it all. You're just missing a little thing called Jesus. But biblically, nothing could be further from the truth. Biblically, we have nothing. Biblically, we bring nothing. Biblically, we offer nothing. Biblically, Jesus is everything. The Bible calls Jesus the Word. It is saying that He is everything. The reason and the reality of God revealed to us the Word made flesh. Outside of Him, church, is nothingness. Jesus, the Word. You can dive in, and I pray you do. But you'll only ever begin to consider, to think about scratching the surface. I'm going to tell you, church, Jesus, the Word. Jesus, the Word. Jesus, the Word of God. May it not be that we at the Harvest Baptist Temple have gotten over what that means and what he teaches us about who God is. Father, we